phone on. It's not better. You got to turn up. Thank you. Thank you for turning it up. Okay. All right. An elderly man was uh, laying on his deathbed. He had only hours to live, and suddenly he smelled chocolate chip cookies. He loved chocolate cookies, chocolate chip cookies more than anything else in the world. And so with the last little bit of strength in his body, he dragged himself out of bed, struggled down the stairs to the kitchen where his wife was baking those tantalizing cookies. And as he reached for one smack, he felt a slap on the back of his hand. His wife scolded him, leave those alone, they're for the funeral. Another elderly man, late... Some of you takes a little bit longer for you to get it. Okay, I understand that. Another elderly man lay in the hospital with his wife of 55 years by his side. Is that you, Ethel? He whispered. Yes, dear. She answered him back. And he said to her, her softly, Remember years ago when I was in the veterans hospital? You were with me then. You were with me when we lost everything in the fire. And Ethel, when we were poor, you stood by me then. Then he sighed and said, I tell you, Ethel, you are bad luck. <laughs> you see, it's jokes like these that are told in the culture, underscoring that many people in America today think that marriage, or at least having a good one, is an uphill battle or almost impossible to have. It's simply not true. And as I look out at some of you today, I realize there are at least four couples here this morning that I did your wedding ceremony. And in case you're thinking, well, this doesn't apply to me, I'm not married, consider the fact that 90% of all adults will at one time be married, so yes, this is for you too, okay? But a lot of people believe that because of the reports that come out, the interpretations of the census figures over the last four decades believe that having a good marriage is just not really possible. Uh, the figures tell us that one out of two marriages will end in divorce, which means you only have a 50-50 chance of staying married. But that's just not true. Because the real figures show that 60% of first-time marriages are intact. And that should tell us something about marriage. But still, many Americans, even if they're still married, are floundering and failing, flailing around in their marriages, trying to make them work. But the best instructions, the best guidelines we have for how marriage is to work are found in the Bible, in God's Word. So I want you to open this morning to Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, and hear Jesus' words and understand that Jesus himself, is uh, quoting from the Old Testament from the very beginning in Genesis. He's quoting from the Old Testament. But hear how Jesus states this principle that you'll find several times in the Bible. It's in verses 6 through 8, Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. Here's what Jesus said. For But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. Consequently, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Now, the first thing we need to understand about marriage is that it is an absolute decision. Let's understand that first. Jesus tells us that marriage is custom made by our Creator for us. He did it in the words of Jesus. Notice what he said. From the very beginning. Jesus was saying that some things never change. And this one goes all the way back to the very beginning. It transcends every culture and every generation on planet earth and in human history. From the very beginning. When God made humanity, he made the first institution was marriage. God designed this thing called marriage for men and women to learn together and to meet each other's needs. It's a great invention, but it, and, but it takes a lot of work to make it running smoothly. My wife ought to know, tomorrow is our 40th wedding anniversary. And for anybody put me that long, 
give the applause for her. For anybody who put up with me that long, it's, it takes a lot of work. Ask her, okay? But it's God's invention. Marriage is God's invention and not a human experiment as so many in our culture think it is today. Marriage works best when we remember that it is God's institution, it's His in in invention, and therefore it works if we do it according to His principles. So Jesus comes back and says, quoting from the Old Testament, For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother. The word leave means to loosen, relinquish, to forsake, to leave utterly and totally. The decision to marry is absolute. Now what I really find interesting in these words is that it is the man who is called upon to leave his family of origin to make a marriage. Now the reason that's interesting because in our culture today, whenever we think of people getting married, we always think of the woman who is leaving her family to make a family of her own. But Jesus says it's a man, the Old Testament says, it's a man who needs to leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Now why is that? What is he talking about when he says leave? To leave means not just leave physically, but it also means to leave the emotional ties that bind people to their family of origin. The fact is, a lot of men have never left behind the emotional ties to mama or to daddy in order to make a good marriage. And that has to be done. And that's why the man is, is included here and given top billing, let's say. And he does this. He leaves those emotional bonds. He leaves physically because he's saying to his wife, I love you. And then he puts his hand to the plow. It actually works at making his marriage prosper. Unfortunately, all too often, this is not how it happens. Far too many men are either reluctant, disinterested, or plain too lazy to make their marriage work. For centuries, women have done the majority of the work that is to be done to make a marriage work. But a reasonable interpretation of what Jesus says here tells us that the man is just as responsible, if not more responsible, to make marriage work by actually working at it. A man told his pastor that he had been dating a woman for seven year, several years and she had begun to wonder if they would ever marry. He told the pastor he didn't know if he could marry her because he said, I don't think she makes me happy. Ever heard that one? His pastor asked him, why he didn't why she didn't make him happy which was a mistake because he went on and on and on all the reasons why she didn't make him happy and finally the pastor interrupted and said well what are you what would make you what kind of wife would make you happy and the more he described what he was looking for in a wife the more convinced the pastor became that what he really needed was not a wife he needed a goldfish you know, the, the pretty kind with a long tail that floats around. Or maybe a golden retriever, but then even a dog makes demands on you now and then emotionally. It doesn't ask how your day was or, or wants you to listen to how its day was, but still what he needed wasn't a wife. He needed something else. Because his whole understanding of why the world exists was to meet his need. And unfortunately, there are a lot of men in our culture today who think that the world exists to meet their needs, and so when they get married, you're supposed to meet my needs, and I'm supposed to be the receiver, which means that she does most of the work, and men just will not work at their marriages. And the reason for that is a man has never grown up. He's never really emotionally broken the tie of mom and dad. Because when you grow up and when you get married, then you work at making your marriage prosper. And that's a problem for a lot of men in our culture. Let's dispel another misunderstanding. Happiness is never found by making front-end demands on our spouses. Happiness instead is the end game. That is, it is the result of a good marriage. In other words, if you want to be happy in marriage, 
then you have to do marriage the way that God intended for it to be done. And when that is in process, happiness begins to show up. If we walked out on the street today and we asked people what they thought the key was to having a great marriage, no doubt we would often hear the four-letter word, love, love. Unfortunately, most people's definition of love is really skewed. The love that we must have for one another in marriage, yes, must be romantic. No, No denying that. That must be there. I don't know how people get married and not have romantic love. But that love must also grow into agape, God's kind of love. A more mature kind of love. Men, go home this afternoon and read the second half of Ephesians chapter 5, and you will find this to be absolutely true. You will. God's kind of love makes the commitment to be sensitive to, to care about, and to meet the needs of the person You say you love. God's kind of love involves a willingness to give every resource of your existence to meet the needs of those you love, not just your wife, but also your children, regardless of the circumstances. In one of my many journeys back toward Arkansas, I always like to read the statewide paper, now called the Arkansas Democrat, It's pretty lousy compared to the old one that was 100 years old, the Arkansas Gazette, but it's the only game in town, and I like to read it. And I actually read this article that a guy wrote to the paper. I kid you not, I'm not making this up. This article was actually in the paper. A guy wrote to the paper, and here's what he said. Women are very touchy about certain gifts, as I discovered years ago when I gave my girlfriend a catcher's mitt for her birthday. You're going to love this. It seemed to me to be a particularly thoughtful gift, especially since she claimed she wasn't getting enough physical exercise. But apparently, she didn't see it that way. The minute she unwrapped it, she ran sobbing from the room. And I thought, at first, those tears streaming down her face were tears of joy. I figured she was overwhelmed by being the first in her crowd uh, to have a catcher's mitt, that sort of thing. Or I figured she was so excited that she couldn't wait to get outside and work on her throws to second base. This is actually in the newspaper, kid you not. When she didn't return after a few hours, I got the hint, you think? You think? Here I spent all this time running around from one sporting goods store to the other trying to find the perfect gift. I mean, we're talking the Johnny Bench model here, top of the line. And she calls me insensitive. I mean, you think that I'd given her a year's subscription to Field and Stream or a box of shotgun shells when everybody knows that they should be saved for Christmas stocking stuffers. Personally, I think she just had a lot of anger in her. (laughs) And she was taking it out on me, not that I'm trying to play amateur psychologist or anything. Well, that guy just doesn't get it. He's never grown up. And he needs a psychologist, by the way. Okay? That's a problem with a lot of men. And men... If we're going to make our marriages work, we have to first grow up in order to start working at them. But it takes both partners in marriage working at the marriage to actually make it work. Secondly, marriage is not only an absolute decision, it is an absolute commitment. Commitment. Jesus said that a man is to leave his mom and dad and cleave to his wife. Now, the word cleave means literally... To bond, to glue, to cling, to adhere, to stick or fasten together. We're talking about the ultimate super glue here. It's the same word that was used in Deuteronomy chapter 28 to describe how leprosy bonds to a person's skin. Marriage is a permanent union and it must be understood that way. Underscoring its uniqueness is the absolute commitment that we make to the relationship itself as well as to each other. I read this story just a couple of weeks before Memorial Day last month, uh, and I wanted to share it with you because I thought it was especially appropriate. Tom Griffith died at the age of 96 in February of this year. Who was Tom Griffith, you ask? Well, he was one of Doolittle's Raiders. Gene, you know who Doolittle was? You You know the story, okay. Uh, Doolittle's Raiders, who carried out 
the fantastic electrifying bombing raid on Tokyo just months after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in, February, in December of 1941. Uh, they were, for, for the first time, land-based bombers would be taking off of moving aircraft carriers. It had never been tried before. Nobody knew it was going to work. That was a feat of courage in and of itself. And then the Japanese learned of the raid. And so the carriers had to launch the aircraft from much further out in the Pacific than was originally planned. All the participants were volunteers, and they were told that they would not have enough fuel to make it back to the carriers. But all of them went anyway. Most bailed out, others crash landed. 62 of 80 survived the war, one of them was Tom Griffith. Incredibly, Tom Griffith, after bailing out over a mountainous forest in China, became seriously ill and almost died. When he recovered, the Chinese got him out of the country, back to our country, where the army sent him to Europe to fly more combat missions. He was shot down by the Germans, was captured, and spent 22 months in a POW camp. But his obituary in the Cincinnati Enquirer underscored his sense of duty and devotion in a totally different way, and I share these words with you. When his wife became ill and had to go to a nursing home, he visited her every day. He walked home after feeding her three times a day. And at the end of the day, he brought home her clothes and then would wash and iron them. And the next morning, he would take them back to the nursing home. And he did that for three years until her death in 2005. Now, folks, do the math. That means that all the time he's walking back and forth, Tom Griffith is in his mid to late 80s while caring for his wife in such a devoted and caring way. That is the kind of commitment that a man must make to flesh out God's intention for marriage. It's the kind of commitment that both spouses must make in order for marriage to work. Commitment is the willingness and the determination to stick together to make the marriage work. Committed people are loyal to each other. They build trust in each other by being honest and by demonstrating consistent integrity. These committed partners expect to stay together, to work to resolve differences, to solve the stresses that come to every marriage, and to surmount the pressures that may tempt them to separate. One recent study shows that marriages that have a high level of commitment have fewer problems. Gee, I wonder why. Couples with a weak commitment or whose commitment becomes weak should often choose to leave whenever problems arise. And every marriage will have multiple problems all through its, its life. Sadly, our culture does not emphasize or support committed marriages. We have the most, in case you didn't know this, we have the most liberal divorce laws of any country in the Western world, America, of all places. Notice the progression, by the way, in the following dictionary definitions of marriage. In 1828, Webster defined marriage, and I quote, a civil and religious contract instituted by God binding on a man and a woman in marital fidelity until death. Gee, does that not sound like what the Bible teaches? Well, it does. It was in the dictionary. But in 1975, marriage was defined as the state of being married or wedlock. Kind of obvious, I think. But anyway, an institution whereby men and women are joined in a special kind of social and legal dependence. That's not so bad. Yet, just 16 years later, marriage was defined as an intimate living relationship without legal sanction. A trial marriage, an intimate social engagement or union of any kind. These and other changes in the way our culture views marriage have served to weaken the institution of marriage in our society today. And as we continue to tinker with and experiment with what marriage really is in our culture, the marriage institution will be weakened even more. 
We've gone from a binding contract or covenant with God to whatever. Here's another uh, side of that. John Whitaker is a medical doctor writing to Women's Day magazine, something I read religiously every day. No, I'm kidding you, okay? Uh, if I did, you'd have to worry about me, but anyway, okay. But it was a set of guidelines for young people in contemplating marriage today. Whitaker provided a contract that would be signed, it witnessed, and dated by all the parties involved. Let me share with you just a couple of provisions in this contract. It goes something like this. I understand that nothing is forever and there are no absolute guarantees and that now, all caps, is the only real forever. I cannot make you happy or unhappy, but I can make myself happy. My happiness will be an invitation for you to join me in happiness, joy, and love. You can tell how I feel about that, okay? When I make commitments to do what I want to do, then I am being free. Don't expect me to accept you as you are. When you fail to maintain mental attractiveness and fail to take care of your mind, don't expect me to accept you as you are. When you fail to maintain physical attractiveness and fail to take care of your body, I have to admit, made me want to throw up when I read that so-called contract. And I imagine that for those people who sign that thing and tried to go by it, the majority of them are probably not married today anymore. Contrast that dribble with a promise that James Dobson's father made to his mother when she agreed to become his wife. A written promise. Here's what he said. I want you to understand and be fully aware of my feelings concerning the marriage covenant we're about to enter. I've been taught at my mother's knee and in harmony with the Word of God, that the marriage vows are unbreakable, and that by entering into them, I am binding myself to you absolutely and for life. The idea of estrangement from you through divorce for any reason will not at any time be permitted to enter into my thinking. And that is the kind of commitment that we must all make for marriage work. Anything less will only make a mess out of marriage. Then there's a third thing that Jesus said. Notice our text. Verse 8. Here's what he says. He says, and the two shall become one flesh. The bonding and blending of two different and very unique personalities is the goal of marriage. Intimacy is at the heart of marriage's uniqueness. Most people think the expression, and the two shall become one flesh, is strictly a reference to sexual intercourse, and certainly it includes that, but marriage means far more than that. Intimacy is the connectedness that a couple feels, an ongoing ability to share interest, activities, hopes for the future, joys, values, pain, mutual interest and openness. Intimacy implies that a couple feels together. They are attuned to one another, pulling in the same direction, sharing similar values, willing to work as partners and work for goals that they both consider to be worthwhile. Couples who have intimacy don't lose their individual unique characteristics, but rather merge their personalities into one. They enjoy spending time with one another and are often each other's best friend. All couples, in case you didn't know this, all couples have periods of adversity and stress. Every couple has not just a few, but a lot of periods of adversity and stress but really good marriages are reflected in those couples who go through those times together and often conclude that they have grown closer as a result. Their love is spelled commitment, and it looks like intimacy. A woman and her husband came to their pastor and said, we're getting a divorce and we wanted to come to you to make sure you approve. <clears throat> I've had people try to pull that one on me, and I won't have anything to do with that. But in any event, in this case, the pastor says to the husband, the Bible says that you're to love your wife 
as Jesus loved the church. And he said, oh, I can't do that. Then the pastor said, well, if you can't believe, begin at that level, begin at a lower level. We're supposed to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Can you at least love her as you would a neighbor? No, he said. That's still, still too high a level. The pastor then said, the Bible says, love your enemies. Begin there. <laughs> Marriages really don't have to have this kind of animosity, division, and hostility. It happens in every marriage. But it's certainly not what God intended for marriage. He designed the relationship to succeed on the basis of His committed love. His kind of love. Committed love. And that love can only be truly called love. Everything else is a poor substitute. A son reflected on the depth of his parents' commitment and its impact on their lives and the lives of those they loved. Here's what he said. This summer, my parents celebrated 70 years of marriage. I hope I live long enough to celebrate 70 years of marriage. They were honored by their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. To all of us, they have been an unequaled example of what God expects from us when we make a covenant. As I reflect over the scores of years that they have to get, they've had together, I have so many memories. I remember them taking in four of my cousins when my aunt died. I was in high school at the time, and my cousins were much younger than me. To this day, my cousins look to my mom and dad as their own. During the time my cousins were with us, mom and dad worked as a team to care for us all. I'm sure there was plenty of stress for them, but we never knew it. Through the years, their home served as a safe haven for relatives and friends. Love always abounded. If there was ever a time when their vows were challenged, it was never visible to anyone around them. I really believe that their commitment to each other was strong at the time of their marriage, and as they walked with the Lord, their commitment to each other grew consistently deeper and richer. And that is a perfect example of what God intended to happen in a marriage. So without Him, we probably won't do the work, at least to the degree necessary, to make marriages great and to make them what God intended. So be sure to invite him along as your partner in the journey to make your marriage great. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I come to you and I thank you for this wonderful relationship that you ordained from the very beginning that we call marriage. What a wonderful experience. If only we would give ourselves to the relationship wholly and completely. All of us need to work at making our marriages what you intended. But God, we need a third person in our marriage. We need you. You are the glue, the cement that will hold our marriages together in difficult times and trying times. Without faith, without a relationship with you, our marriages are prey to the enemy. And my prayer this morning is that all of us will not only recommit ourselves to making our marriages strong, but also commit ourselves to putting you in the center of our marriage. Everyone, husbands, wives, and especially our children, will profit from making you at the heart of the marriage relationship. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.